Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth installment of the Purdue Technology Alumni Speaker Series. My name is Derek Herman, and I am the Manager of Alumni Relations and Special Events for Purdue Polytechnic Institute. The Alumni Speaker Series is a joint collaboration between the Polytechnic and the Purdue Technology Alumni Board. The purpose of the Alumni Board is to support the efforts of Purdue Polytechnic Institute, formerly the College of Technology, facilitate communication between the school and its alumni, provide programs for professional growth, and enhance alumni relationships with the university and the Purdue Alumni Association. To learn more about the Purdue Technology Alumni Board, please use the Get Involved link on the Alumni and Friends page of the Purdue Polytechnic website. The Alumni Speaker Series is a monthly series created as an opportunity to engage technology alumni on topics that have broad interest to the alumni base. The presenters for each session are technology alumni of the Purdue Polytechnic faculty. If you are interested in presenting in a future session or have suggestions for topics, please email techdev at purdue.edu with a brief synopsis of the proposed presentation. The only guidelines for the proposal are that the topic is of broad interest and the presenter is an alumnus or faculty member of Purdue Polytechnic Institute. Today's presentation will cover the Internet of Things and being presented by John McDonald. 1995 Computer and Information Technology alumna. John is CEO of Clear Object, Indiana's leading Internet of Things systems integrator. He is a founder and board member of the Indiana Technology and Innovation Association, chairman of the Technology and Innovation Committee of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce, a board member of TechPoint, the Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce, the Indiana India Business Council, and the Social Enterprise Alliance. Additionally, he is a member of the IBM Partner World Global Business Partner Advisory Council, the Advisory Council for Hamilton Southeastern Schools, the Workforce Alignment Council of Ivy Tech Community College, and the Dean's Council for the Purdue Polytechnic Institute. John is the author of Where IoT is Made, as well as two history books about Indiana, Lost Indianapolis and Flame Out. John resides in Fishers, Indiana, with his wife and three children. Welcome, John. Hey, thanks, Derek. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I was bored by my own introduction, so we need to <laughs> I need to edit that thing down uh, so as to not uh, cause everyone else to fall asleep when they hear in the future. But that was really generous of you. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining. I want to walk you through this thing called the Internet of Things. Some of you may have seen some of this information before, so my apologies to you, but those of you who are new to it, welcome aboard, because I want to talk to you today about why it's really the Internet of everything. So first of all, I'd like to share with you through the lens of one thing that's being impacted greatly, which is um, um, autonomous vehicles or cars that drive themselves. There are five levels of autonomous vehicles. Uh, level one is in many cars today. Uh, cruise control is a good example of this. You can set the speed of the car and it'll stay going to the same speed and rate uh, without you having to put your foot on the, on the pedal. Uh, level two autonomous vehicles, um, think of them as adaptive cruise control, uh, where the car will automatically keep the distance between you and the car in front of you. Uh, level three autonomous vehicles, um, steering cruise control. For limited periods of time, you can take your hands off of the wheel. The car will stay on the road automatically without you having to have your hands on it the whole time. Uh, level four autonomous vehicles. Um, are cars that can be pre-programmed to drive from one location to another uh, without driver input and fail safely, as in if there's a roadblock or something, it'll pull over and stop and wait for driver input. And level five autonomous vehicles, for those of you who can see the WebEx today, have no steering wheel. Uh, when I ask people, you know, where they think we are in the industry, uh, often when I speak, you know, most of the answers are, you know, level two, maybe some level, level threes. Uh, but in reality, where we're at is that Ford, GM, Chrysler, all the major manufacturers of automotive uh, vehicles have all promised to have a, a fully autonomous level four vehicle in the marketplace by the year 2021. 
And because the um, cycles for new vehicles often lead the calendar by a few months, you know, those level four autonomous vehicles will be on the dealer lots uh, in many cases by the middle to end of next year. That means that by this time next year, you should be able to drive your new your car onto a Ford dealership and have your new car drive you home. Um, and so what happens in the world where all the cars drive themselves? Well, the first thing is you need a lot less cars. Um, what we have is the ability to maybe share those cars more actively uh, between people based on where they might live. We tax ourselves to build roads, but we make everybody buy cars, which doesn't make a lot of sense to a lot of us. The other thing you need is a lot less roads. Um, we have to have so many roads because we have to keep a safe distance between ourselves and the vehicle in front of us. But if all of the cars drive themselves, you don't need to keep any distance at all between them, which is what an Indy car driver would tell you uh, is the best way to save uh, gas. You also don't need to run them at 55 miles an hour. You can run them at 200 miles an hour, which means that if you were in uh, West Lafayette on campus, you could go to Chicago for lunch. Uh, and if you don't think that this isn't already happening, this is a picture of the Virginia Smart Road. It's the first road in America where they are training vehicles at 200 miles an hour. You can see in the picture, if you can see, there's a loop at the end. Um, when they're done constructing this and done testing, the intent is to connect this up to the freeway system in Virginia, and it'll be the first road in America where it'll be illegal to drive on with your hands on the wheel. Apply that idea to delivering products. Um, you know, uh, today, if you wanted to order something uh, on Amazon, you pop open your app on your phone and tap away or on your computer. But very soon, once you do so, about 15 minutes later, a vehicle like what you just saw will pull up to the end of your street. At the top will pop a drone, and that drone will ferry the box that you ordered from the vehicle over to your front door. This is the safe way to use drones, uh, just sort of couriers from the curb. Uh, let's say if you ordered a T-shirt, maybe, and you open up the box and the T-shirt's the wrong size, you get on your app again. Fifteen minutes later, this truck shows back up again, uh, ferries over the old box, puts the new one box on your doorstep, and drives off. Um, that's not science fiction. That video that some of you saw in the pictures that some of you just saw is an actual autonomous UPS vehicle doing what it is that I just described. And if you don't think that this isn't already happening, Consider this, in a world where all you are able to get anything that you want delivered to your doorstep within 15 minutes, the reality is that you don't need stores. And if you don't think that that's already happening, think about all of the retail companies that have either shut down completely or closed more than a few hundred stores in the last six to 12 months. It's already happening. Apply that idea to hospitals. What's one of the main reasons why we have hospitals? It's to get access to machines that are difficult to operate and difficult to move. But what if instead of uh, if I had a problem with my knee that I needed to have a scan done instead of going to a hospital or a clinic or a center, instead a vehicle pulls up in front of my house and uh, I open the door to see inside and this is what I see, nobody in there. Um, push the button on the wall, uh, it lights up the left screen with the world-renowned expert in running MRI machines and the other screen, the world-renowned expert in interpreting MRI results. Hold still, Mr. McDonald. And we now know what's wrong with your knee, so in about 15 minutes we're going to send out another vehicle that's going to have a brace in it, and we want you to put that on your knee, and don't forget to close the door behind you. In, in that world, to be fair, you don't need hospitals. Uh, apply that idea to autonomous recreational vehicles, which sounds pretty frivolous, but if I was going to go to Chicago tonight for a meeting tomorrow, this is kind of a pain in the butt. I have to pack a bag, go out to my car, drive up 65, maybe go to the airport, board a plane, wait in the TSA line, rent a car, drive it downtown, park the car, all this stuff I have to do. But what if instead my hotel room came to pick me up tonight and drove me to Chicago while I slept? Uh, in that world, you don't need um, Hertz, you don't need Hilton, you don't need Southwest Airlines. In fact, what we're going to learn very shortly is that during the course of this presentation, um, several of our unfortunate uh, friends, neighbors here in Indiana are going to be either injured or killed in car accidents. 
And the reality is that all of those car accidents are preventable. You are the unsafe factor in driving. And this is going to begin on a uh, rural road, maybe somewhere in Montana, from maybe the hours of midnight to 6 a.m., where that road will be marked as, um, as automated only. You will not be allowed to be on that road with your hands on the wheel. Uh, later, that will extend to all interstate highways and then maybe all state highways. And in truth, it'll, cars will have steering wheels for some time because it's difficult to imagine maneuvering a truck through the streets of Manhattan without a steering wheel. But under most circumstances, you'll either not want to nor be allowed to drive with your hands on the wheel. And if you consider the problem from a mathematical perspective, and I like looking at things from a numerical perspective, uh, the average American spends about 101 minutes a day uh, driving, a little less here in Indiana, a little more on the coast. You will be uh, driving on average for 61 years before your children take your driver's license away from you. Uh, that means you will spend about 37,935 hours of your life watching road reflectors zip by. There are about 221.7 million registered drivers in America, which means in total we will be spending 8.4 trillion hours of our lives driving, except for we're about to get all the time back. It is the biggest one-time leap in human productivity ever. And that, uh, my fellow uh, Purdue friends, is just cars. If you apply that same concept to absolutely everything that you interact with on your daily life, from the appliances in your home to the machines in your workplace uh, to the cars that you drive, as we just did, you only begin to scratch the surface of what is about to happen. So imagine telling yourself in 2009, um, that you will um, publish all your baby pictures live publicly for the entire world to see, uh, that you're going to stay in a complete stranger's apartment instead of a hotel room, uh, that you will never again buy another music album, that you will, you will, however, buy a mattress over your telephone, that you will willingly get into a stranger's car and get out without paying, <laughs> that you will make as much entertainment content as you consume, that you will never watch scheduled television again, or that you will go for years, if ever, before visiting a bank branch. That was just a, a decade ago. And yet, all of those companies that I put up there were the market leaders in those spaces, and they're replaced now with the market leaders in those spaces, which are new companies. In fact, what's happening is, in case after case after case, you've got companies like Netflix, that is the largest broadcaster in the world, and yet they don't have any TV stations. Uh, Airbnb is the biggest hotel company in the world, but they don't own any hotels. Um, Uber is the biggest car rental company in the world. They do not own any cars. Right? And case after case, these are companies that didn't even exist 10 years ago, and they're not the up-and-comers. They're the market leaders, and they did so without having to cover off on any of the capital assets of any of their predecessors. So if it's not TV studios and hotel rooms and cars that they own, what do they own? And the answer is it's data. Uh, Uber knows very little about you. They know that you're on a street corner and they know you need to get from A to B and they know your credit card information. But on that amount of data alone, they can build a multi-billion dollar business. What if they knew more? So this is happening all over Indiana. Cummins Engine and Columbus has a system called Connected Diagnostics, where whenever there's an engine problem uh, that would cause a diagnostic issue, such as maybe miscalibration or emissions, a message is sent to Cummins to let them know what's happening, and a message is sent back to the fleet operator that lets them know what's going on with the engine and what they should do about it. Uh, pull it over and stop, wait for the next service interval. They can even pre-roll parts through the internal network and intercept the truck at the nearest Cummins care facility more rapidly. What's interesting about this system is that they are winning business based on the data stream. Uh, I guess you could say that shouldn't surprise anybody on this phone line, but what might be more surprising is to realize that what they're not winning business on so much is the traditional measurements of things like torque and reliability. They're actually winning business based on the data stream that surrounds the engine, which makes the data stream at least as important as the engine itself. 
another example, uh, Rolls-Royce uh, out of Indianapolis uh, and makes jet engines, and they have pioneered a business model where organizations like Delta Airlines can phase out the ownership of jet engines in favor of hiring Rolls-Royce to supply them engines as a service. Uh, this is really great for Delta because it gives them a manageable expense around which they can plan. And it's really great for Rolls-Royce because it changes something that was a purchase and support model into a recurring revenue stream. And anybody in technology knows how great recurring revenue is. But it also means that the data stream coming from the engines is really important because if they got a bad engine they keep moving around, it could be the difference between profit and loss for the entire program that month. So in this case, again, that the engine data is almost as important as the engine. In fact, you could stretch your mind a little bit and see a world not too far off where they could start doing the same service for engines that they didn't even make. Right. In fact, it doesn't take too much of a stretch of imagination to think that if they got really, really good at it, they might even be able to stop making engines, which is to say that the data stream is as important and may even be more important and in some day may even be the product itself. Another example to illustrate that this is happening everywhere and not just for big corporations, there's a small company up in Auburn, Indiana called SCP Products. SCP makes uh, igniters that go in gas stoves and furnaces and things. The CEO of the company called up when they were making a bid to go uh, offer these igniters to a very large um, manufacturer of appliances. But that, what that manufacturer wanted them to do is to put a sensor in the igniter that would talk to the circuit board that it plugs into uh, that will predict when the igniter was going to fail. And the reason they wanted to do that is because the appliance manufacturer wanted to send the consumer a box with a new igniter in it because the stove called and said it needs a new igniter. The uh, CEO of the company asked if we could help him with that, and I said half-jokingly, I hope so. Uh, and not just because, you know, that's what we do at Clear Object, but let your mind go for a little bit. What happens if I can't? And a competitor of his in Ohio or California or China figures out how to do that. What he realized in that moment was that that's now the new minimum standard because if that big global appliance manufacturer needed that capability, it means everybody's going to want that capability. And if he can't figure out how to put it in his igniter, he's not going to be making igniters for very long. And so what it also means is this little igniter company in Auburn, Indiana, is an Internet of Things company, and the reality is they all are. Every single company has to create and build a digital product that today will differentiate their product in the marketplace in order to have a physical product before long. And at some point, that digital product may become the product. And so what's happening all over the place is nothing short of what effectively is the fourth major shift in our global economy, which is a ridiculous statement that I'm going to try and support. The first major organization structure of our global economy was agrarian, organized farming. Prior to that, everybody had to farm for themselves in order to eat. But after we got farming, we had these places called marketplaces where you could go markets, where you could go buy agricultural products, which meant you could do other things other than farming to be able to eat huge creator of uh, value and creator and destroyer of business value. Next major organization structure was the Industrial Revolution, making things. Um, prior to that, you had to make everything that you used. The bowl you ate out of, the table you sat at, the house you lived in, you had to make out of your own. But then we got these things called factories, where then you could go to places called stores and buy products that were made by other people. Great creator and destroyer of business value third organization structure was a revolution, how we move things. This happened shortly after World War II. Um, it's so soon that many people don't see it that way. A lot of people were alive today, were alive then. But this is when we got uh, container ships, jet air transport, uh, interstate highways, ways that would uh, effortlessly move products across the planet. Great creator and destroyer business value. The last revolution, though, is now, and it's smart things. It's putting smarts in those very things. And what's curious about that is you don't get any points for being good at those previous industries. In other words, just because you were good at making, moving, and growing things doesn't mean you're going to be good at making those things smart in the data economy. It, you could. It might be, but maybe not. Right, And so what it does is it gives an opening for new competitors from completely different areas of the world to be able to encroach on marketplaces and upend them like Netflix, like Uber, like Airbnb. So what is enabling this revolution to happen? 
Well, the first thing is the explosion of smarts and software in everyday devices. The Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor, a device largely conceived of in the late 1970s, has about 1.7 million lines of software code in it, which is a lot of software for a device of that time. If you fast forward to the uh, Boeing 787, that was a device largely conceived of in the late 1990s. It jumps to having about 6.5 million lines of software code in the avionics and control systems of the plane, which is a huge jump in a very short period of time. But the 2019 Mercedes-Benz S-Class 550 has 20 million lines of software code in it, 14 million of which are in the radio alone making it the most sophisticated device most humans will interact with on a regular basis and has to boot successfully in two seconds every time you turn the power on. That is in a device that when I was in high school was a silver box with two knobs on it. And now it has in, it, in its inside of it um, over twice the amount of software in the entire avionics and control systems of the Boeing 787. Let that sink in. That powerful amount of software is driving a second revolution, and that's how the Internet is being used itself. See, the entire history of the Internet has really been about an Internet of people. Uh, we say we carry around in our cell phones all of human knowledge in our pocket, but in reality, that cell phone is really kind of stupid if it's not connected to the Internet. Uh, there's not really anything on it. If I was to put it in my pocket and take an airplane ride, the first thing it does when you land is correct its internal clock. It can't even keep time well. But what it does do is it serves as an endpoint, makes me as a person a smarter point to the, uh, to the Internet. I have five senses in my body. My iPhone has 12, all of which are designed to make me a smarter endpoint to the Internet. But what's changing is how that is being applied. And in addition to this fourth wave of the business economy, we are also being presented with what effectively is a fourth wave in computing. See, the first wave of organized business computing happened in, you know, between the 1960s and early 1980s, and it was centralized processing and centralized data and access on a, on a mainframe computer using dumb terminals, which were not just dumb, they were stupid. Their only function was to send keystrokes to the box and down the hallway and to display characters on the screen. They were more effective often at heating up your office than they were at anything else. But when what we did starting in about 1980 was we started giving you your own computer, first in the form of PCs and then later in the form of laptops and allowing you to connect up and do your own spreadsheets and your own reports and your data. So we distributed the access to it. The problem with that, though, was that we didn't really solve some of the problems, like should you see that data? How do I know you have the right data? How do I keep you from stealing that data and taking it away? So what we did starting in 2000 was we started re-centralizing the data and applications into these new things called the data center and giving you access to the new dumb terminal a cell phone. But now what's happening is with this explosion of smarts at the edge of the equation, what's happening again is we're again redistributing computing power to the edge. But this time it's not PCs and laptops, it's everyday devices. And what that's also doing is it's changing who it is, are the winners and losers, they're very different in this new economy but also it's changing how the cloud itself is being used into a place where all the data goes, that's what it used to be in big data, into something where only selected data goes to be interpreted and understood. And on that, let me talk to the, about you about the next enabling technology, and that is machine learning. What is happening to that data now in the cloud? It's not just being stored like it was anymore. We're using it to train models to think the way that we think. Uh, so, Caveman uh, 1 over here on the left on the screen is uh, the first person to figure out how to make fire. So, Caveman 2 over here on the right is trying to learn how to make fire. Now, he did not go to college to learn this, and he did not go to the library and check out a, a, or t a, check out a book. What he did was he watched Caveman 1 make fire, tried to make it himself, failed, was corrected by the first caveman, did it again until he got it right, which as I will submit to you, is how all humans have ever learned anything. Uh, if you were to drop your cell phone on the sidewalk, a lot of us would go to uh, YouTube and search for how to repair an iPhone screen. And if we thought it was within our capability set, we'd go to Amazon and order a screen repair kit. You should probably order two because you're going to screw the first one up. 
Uh, once it arrives, then you go back to YouTube and you search again for how to replace an iPhone screen. And you follow the steps and the person on the screen, watch him do it, try to do it yourself. And if you succeed, you've now done an incredibly technical task that you were never trained to do before and maybe didn't even think you'd have to do when you got up that morning. By watching another human do something, trying to do it yourself, correcting yourself, correct, being corrected, and doing again and again, which is how all humans ever learn everything. But curiously, that is not how we've been using computers. Instead, what we've been doing is we've been using this places to store a bunch of data and process that data. We have not, however, asked it to help us understand what that data means. And so what's happening is, is we're taking in data, much like a pixelated photograph becomes more crisp with each wave of data comes in. We're training a model to interpret and understand what it means. So very small live data points can confirm what the model means with very little information. The application of that idea is very new on the planet. If you sort of started at year zero, and charted human cognitive power. It's gone up somewhat uh, as we've gotten, we live longer and have organized education. But starting in about the year 1950, the amount of computing cognitive power comes off the zero mark. So then in about 2015, it's estimated that the entire computing power on the planet roughly equal the processing power of one mouse, not the one on your desk, the rodent. So there's an interesting moment that's predicted to be about 2023 where all of the computing power on the planet will roughly equal the processing power of one human brain. But then there's a moment slightly beyond that, which is ominously called um, the singularity, <laughs> where it's estimated that the computing power on the planet uh, will roughly equal all human brains. Uh, this is um, just a pure play idea. It doesn't consider sort of augmented brains with technology, right? This idea of computing power that's so powerful that it actually supersedes our ability to cognitively understand is new. And so if you change the time scale of this to go back to roughly the beginning of civilization, this is what it looks like. It's happened so rapidly, it looks like a vertical wall. Uh, that, uh, the implications of that on, for humanity are still yet to be understood. So let me try to bring these things together for you in an example. Um, let's say you're driving down the road in your car, and your car notices that you're not keeping your lane as effective as you did about an hour ago. And it knows that you like chai lattes, and it knows that it's 3 in the morning, so you might be tired. So it also knows there's a 24-hour Starbucks, and so it asks you on the radio, would you like a Starbucks? And if you say yes, it beams your payment information ahead, orders the coffee, puts a map on the screen to drive you to the location, the car thus having saved its own life as well as yours. Now, what's interesting about this story is that I can tell you with great confidence with all that software in your car radio, if your car is anything less than five years old, it has the ability to do what I just said. But what's more interesting to think and ponder for a minute is how did it figure out that you needed coffee? You see, there are all these data points and in and of themselves don't really mean very much. Driver behavior patterns, customer preferences, weather information, time of day. But if you assemble them together into a picture, you can infer that you need coffee. In fact, what you could do is use a lot of historical data to train a computer model so that only the slightest amounts of live data would confirm the model. Like you're driving down the road in your car at 3 in the morning, 80% chance you need coffee. You wiggle in your lane ever so slightly, 100% chance. So only the two smallest live data points confirm a model that turns you into a lead for Starbucks. And so that's what's happening now in the cloud as we train the data to be able to get selected pieces of information and for a great value from them. But there's another lesson in this. Uh, I often ask people in the audience, how many of you own a Nest thermostat on your wall? Uh, and a few hands go up. And when I ask them why they don't, the answers usually are it's a little bit wonky and expensive for what it does, and it's kind of creepy that Google knows when I'm coming and going from my house. You see, the other question that that story sets up is, well, John, if uh, my car can order me coffee like you say it does, how come it doesn't? And the answer is because you don't want it to. Who else do you not want to know that you're weaving in your lane at 3 in the morning, <laughs> right? And even if you get over that, uh, you know, who wants their car spamming him? Who else wants that data? Well, Dunkin' Donuts wants that data. Hilton has a hotel room they didn't sell you the night before, and they want to give it to you half off. 
So what's the first thing you do when you find an app is tracking your location, right? You go shut it off or delete the app. See, we've been stealing the data from you and not paying you the valuable amount that, it's you, uh, that it is. Um, this is why IoT isn't working very well in the consumer space because there isn't a surefire method of routing the value of the data back to you as a consumer. Think of it this way. What if instead that you, you got a, uh, a letter in the mail at the end of every month and it was from Google, and then you opened it up and it, was, it said a check inside, and it said, Dear you, thanks for the data from your Nest thermostat this month. Keep it up and closes a check for the value we were able to achieve from it. Uh, you would certainly put a nest throwing thermostat on your wall. A lot of us were really angry at Facebook over the holiday season because they sold our data to Cambridge Analytica. But in reality, you kind of knew they were selling your data. But why were you angry? It's because you didn't get a cut. <laughs> right? If Facebook had sent you a check, you'd probably be going back through boxes and boxes of old photographs and posting everything you could. Right? And so that idea of taking the data from you and getting value and not returning it to you is important to solve. And one of the ways we're solving that is with this technology called blockchain. Now, blockchain was created for the cryptocurrency business uh, for Bitcoins because the curiosity about cryptocurrency is it doesn't exist in the physical world intentionally, right? So how do you know that you have one? Well, the answer is the only way you know you have one is to be able to trace back everyone who's handled the Bitcoin back to its creation when it was mined. That's the only way you know it. And so the only way you can test for that is to have a publicly addressable and auditable register of all of the transactions of that Bitcoin going all the way back to its inception. And so the way this technically works is, let's say you want to buy a product. The information about that product or that transaction is put out to a bunch of nodes on a local network and the various pieces of data, metadata, like timestamp and digital signature and encryption key are validated to make sure that the data is good. If it's good, a record is ended, added to the end of a public chain of records of the transaction and a message is sent back to the original device so that's okay to proceed. That's all it is, nothing more, nothing less. But if you applied that technology to all kinds of other things, you could start to begin to wonder about how it might be useful for both data control as well as for returning value. Think about that Nest Learning Thermostat example from a minute ago. This allows me to then route data back to value back to the creator of the data, which is me, for having that Nest Thermostat on the wall. Also over the holidays, we weren't able to eat romaine lettuce because some you know, farm somewhere had some contamination of romaine lettuce, which is really stupid in this day and age because we have biomarkers we can spray on plants that will tell us not only what farm they came from, but even what row they were planted in. The reason we don't use them is because they're commodity products and there's no economic value to be returned to the farmer for the added expense of spraying these biomarkers on. But if you could spray that biomarker on, then you would be able to blockchain not only what field it came from, but who picked it, what truck it rode in, what um, warehouse it was stored in, what what train it was transported on, what factory squeezed it into a can, how long the can was stored, where it was stored, and the whole pathway to get to the shelf in the grocery store so that I could scan two cans of green beans and know which one had the shorter pathway from the farm to my hand, thus uh, the one that probably had more nutrients and less processing and one that the store could charge more for and route that value back to the farmer. So applying blockchain in the food chain gives a pathway for us to put value back into the hands of the originator of the data, the farmer that planted the green bean. Another example of this is a real curious thing happened when my daughter turned 18 years old. The night before it happened, I knew everything about her medical history, and the next morning I knew nothing. I was not allowed to see anything without her permission even though I pay all of her medical bills and her insurance because we have these rig regulations that prohibit me from seeing these things and controlling the day. It's very ham-handed. It's either all or nothing, right? But the way it should work is if I was going to go get that knee MRI, I want that doctor to know certain things about me. But if I walk out on the street and get hit by a bus and the EMTs come and I want them to know everything. And so what we really need to be able to do is control our own data about ourselves. And one of the ways we might be able to do that is applying blockchain into the medical field. At any rate, you get the idea. So if we bring all these things together, um, 
what does it really imply? Well, I want to go back to that story a minute ago about Netflix and Airbnb and Uber. And I told you if it's not, you know, cars and TV studios and hotels that they own, what do they own? And I said the answer was data, right? Well, they also represent something else. What they represent is platforms where individual people are enabled to offer up their own goods and services in a global marketplace of products to other people directly. See, the content in the Uber model, whose car is it? It's your car. Who's the driver? You're the driver. Uh, in Airbnb, whose hotel room is this? Your, your hotel room. Even Netflix works this way. Um, most of the content on there is created by very small production companies, sometimes individuals that post it up on Netflix in the hopes that you'll download and watch it so Netflix will buy more. Most of the products on Amazon are not, not crea- uh, supplied by Amazon. They're not created by Amazon at all. They're created by a lot of individual companies, very small ones, that offer them up on the global marketplace for you to be able to buy them. And so what you see all over the place is these platforms that create the ability for individual people as entrepreneurs to offer up their own goods and services to others effortlessly over the Internet without any intermediation. And that is a very powerful force, right? And, and what it means is it has to effectively turn all of us into, into, into entrepreneurs, people that are able to deal with that reality and you know, change either who we are or what we do or what our company does to be able to deal with that new reality of acting in a global marketplace. So what are the key things that are required to be able to make that work? Well, you know, in school you, you were taught you know, the fire triangle where you need heat and fuel and oxygen to be able to have fire. Um, well, there's a, another triangle that's very similar to that for a business, and it's um, capital ideas and talent. And, you know, just like in the fire triangle, even if you have oxygen, heat, and fuel, it doesn't necessarily mean you have fire. You have to have something that lights the spark, and that's the job of the individual entrepreneur is to take capital ideas and talent and spark, spark it up. So how are we doing on that? Well, you know, I, good news, ideas are everywhere. Everybody has them. <laughs> so there's no shortage of them uh, around here. There's no shortage of them in the Purdue family. There's no shortage of them in Indiana. Uh, so great news, we're doing fine on that. In capital, however, we've got some problems. Um, you know, one of the reasons why it's so important to have access to capital is because you need to be able to pour on uh, a business like a growth hormone the ability to grow it faster than it normally would. See, technology has a limited lifespan. And if you, you know, open a pizza parlor, you, you know, you don't have this problem. You, you save some money, you go buy a pizza oven, you install the pizza oven, you start making pizzas. If you're any good at it, people will buy them. You save some of that money, you buy a second oven, right? And the reason you can do that is because making pizza hasn't changed in hundreds of years. But technology is a very odd business in that everything you do today, sometime between tomorrow and like five years from now, is completely obsolete which means if you waited for the normal business cycles to grow a technology company, um, you would not be able to uh, exploit the value of the technology before it became obsolete. Why is this relevant? It's because every company is a technology company, and just some don't know it yet. Go back to my example of the igniter. Um, that company was an igniter company until it had to become a technology company, and they all are. And so access to capital is super important in this. Uh, there are sort of four stages to it, pre-seed, friends and family, seed money, build the MVP, Series A, find the market, uh, Series B or beyond, build the user base, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million. Um, and why am I sharing this with you? Because we have a problem with this in our family. Uh, here in Indiana, we are 27th in the amount of venture capital deployed nationally. Um, we are behind every single one of the states that neighbor us and a few other ones in the Midwest that don't. Uh, so the importance of growth in capital is really important to the growth of our digital economy, particularly around here. And that's why it's relevant, because that means those companies don't exist in the marketplace where everybody has to be a digital company in those places. And then talent. Talent is um, also a problem, right? This is a graph of the percentage of the adult population that owns a business as their primary job based on education level. This is from the Kaufman organization. Kaufman.org does a lot of research into entrepreneurship. If you look at the black line at the top, those are college graduates. And you look at the teal line at the bottom, those are high school kids. 
you can see that the amount of the percentage of businesses owned by college graduates actually declined precipitously over the last several years. And at the same time, the high school kid group has grown to the point where they're almost equal. Well, who are those kids? The answer is they're my kids. And what they're seeing is that they can build a website. They can code an app. They're not learning this stuff in school. They can open their own business doing these things. And so they're already seeing what it is that we need to see as their parents and leaders, that they're already participating in the digital economy and that the system that we built for them to educate them is increasingly irrelevant to them in being able to build their skills. Because, again, how do they learn the skills? By watching other people do things and trying it themselves and doing it repeatedly until they get it right. This accounts for the popularity of things like YouTube and online learning. Massive amounts of learning is being done outside of the normal system to service this need for individual people to make themselves relevant in the digital economy and offer up their services directly to one another. So what do you do? How do you get started? What, what's the next step that you should be taking if you are in any way worried or concerned um, or even energized by the story of the whole world going to becoming a digital marketplace. So the first thing you need to do is stop fearing technology. A lot of people think that you know these things are going to come, uh, you know, become sentient and start zapping us out of the sky like Skynet. The entire purpose of technology is to take a human drudgery and make it so simple that anyone can do it. When those cavemen were putting together fire, it was really difficult. You had to go get two sticks, the right stones, bang them together, blow on them, all this other stuff. Now we've encapsulated all of human knowledge into a matchstick and we give them away for free at the hostess stand of every restaurant. So when we figured out fire, did we stop? No. Then we figure out the wheel and other things. The whole idea of technology is to make things simple and behind us so we can go do other things with our time and energy. And so too is with this. The next thing you need to do is not as be sure of where you're going to start. I can tell you with great confidence there are only four things that you have to get right to get any digital transformation or IoT project right. First of all, you have to have an idea. You have to have a clear design of what it is that you want to do. Then you have to have edge devices where you can get the data from. You have to have code that interprets the data and understands it, and you have to have cloud where all the data goes to be interpreted and understood. It's only those four things. It's never anything different. And so the problem is a lot of companies start with the thing because they make it and they think they understand it, keyword being think, and they go right across and hire a bunch of developers to build them code. What they result in is a system that looks like a bunch of developers design it, which is not that great, without any thought to how it's going to scale or be secure, and you get a failure. So you have to start with the design and let it drive you to the right devices and the right data and the right code and the right models on the cloud to be able to understand it. The next thing you need to cut tackle is your doubt about your own skills. Uh, Michael Dell at Dell Computer, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, Steve Jobs at Apple, Larry Ellison at Oracle, Bill Gates at Microsoft, Sir Richard Branson at Virgin, longtime CEO of Nintendo, both the founders of Twitter. Other than being technology executives that we all admire, what's one of the things that they all have in common? The answer is none of them have a college degree. What's interesting about technology is it never was and still isn't required to have a college degree to be a technologist. Anybody can do it. Now, to be fair, there's lots of reasons to get a college degree. A lot of jobs that I, w I want my doctor to have a college degree. And I can't think of a single job that isn't enhanced by it. But to require it is a misappropriation. And so anybody can do this with a minimal amount of training. And so you have to give yourself then permission to go, go out and achieve your dream. And that's this last point. This guy, Nolan Bushnell, uh, you may not have heard of his name before. He founded this company called Atari, which you probably have heard of before. Took all of his millions from that, founded this thing called Chuck E. Cheese, which I'm sure you've heard of before. Uh, then he took uh, his millions and founded a venture capital firm that you haven't heard of before that invested in the company I'm sure you haven't heard of before, but you know what it is. It was the first company to digitize maps, the so digital maps behind Google Maps. So this one guy is responsible for you know, Google Maps, uh, the video game industry, and um, scary animatronic characters and bad pizza. And so what he said about this is the critical element is getting off your butt and doing something. It's as simple as that. A lot of people have ideas, but there are a few who decide to do something about them now, not tomorrow, not next week, but today. The true entrepreneur is a doer, not a dreamer. So here's the, here's the punchline. 
all ideas for improvement are free. Every one of your customers and you have them. They need access to capital to give them oxygen. No talent left behind. We need every brain in this state and this ecosystem as fuel. And they need encouragement, and you need encouragement to be the spark right now because the digital economy is not tomorrow, not next week, but today. You need to be a doer and not a dreamer. That's my presentation. Thanks for listening, everybody. And I think, Derek, we may have some time for some questions if anybody wants to ask them. While we're waiting, Derek, one of the things that oftentimes I'm asked is, um, you know, what happens to all the jobs uh, in this economy, right? Um, what happens to all the truck drivers or, or whatever? Um, and, you know, the answer is that we're still going to need truck drivers. Um, what they turn into is, you know, more like over-the-road trains with a conductor who's monitoring systems as, the, as it moves across and maybe gets out of the cab every so often, disconnects a trailer, backs it into a loading dock, and moves on. All, always technology disrupts work workers. Um, and to be, uh, be sure, there will be some people that will say, um, you know, woe is me. <laughs> right, but uh, all of human history, have, there have been more people that have tried to figure out how to use the time that they've been given to reinvent themselves. I, don't, I see no difference uh, in that uh, happening in the future. The only thing that's different is the speed, right? It's the speed. And, you know, our education system was designed to train people to do a job once for their whole career. And in reality now, it needs to be reformulated to be able to be an ongoing training mechanism for people throughout their entire career. Uh, we just don't have the capacity and the setup to retrain people multiple times over the course of their lifetime, which is what we really need, and help them make that transition. I see one question. With any groundbreaking technology, security is always a big question, especially when it comes to hacking from hostile agents. Can you talk to some of the more common security concerns in this area and what the potential solution might Yeah, absolutely. So in order to um, do security right, you have to have a healthy appreciation of the difference between real versus perceived security. Um, you can, uh, there's any amount of technology that we can apply to real security issues and solve them, but no amount of technology and spending fixes perceived security issues. Uh, and let me illustrate this with an example. Let's say that you're ordering a product from Amazon uh, and you get to that page where you type in your credit card number. Everybody gets this queasy feeling in the pit of their stomach. You know it's secure, but still. Then you decide that queasy feeling is actually that you're hungry. So you go to a restaurant, you order a meal, and at the end of the meal, you hand the waiter your credit card, and he walks away for like 10 minutes with all the numbers on the back and your signature, and you don't think anything of it. So when I share that story in public, I ask rhetorically, what's the difference? Why do you feel so differently between the first example and the second one? And the answer is that people cannot trust computers, at least not yet. People can only trust other people. So even in, though it's fleeting and even though it's simple, in that moment with the waiter, you're developing an interpersonal human bond so that if you get an errant charge on your credit card, your mind goes, it was the waiter. Now, which of these two scenarios is more secure? Obviously, Amazon is, but your mind perceives it as precisely the opposite. And that's the difference between real and perceived security. There is any amount of technology and standards that we can and do hold companies like Amazon to for securing our data and punish them if they don't. But there's no amount of security that can be done to keep the waiter from going behind the curtain and taking a picture of the front and back of your cart. So if you wasted a bunch of time and energy on trying to solve that problem, you will have missed the real problem, which is keeping the data secure in the secure system. So, and if you want an egregious example of this, uh, there's a massive system that we have in this country designed to make us all feel safer, which doesn't actually make us any safer, and that's the Transportation Safety Administration. But does anybody think that you can't put a bit of plastic in the bottom of a shoe and put it right through that scanner and walk right on a plane, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really make us any more safe, right? Ironically, what's the best way to stop an armed gunman from taking down an airplane? The answer is arm everybody on the plane, <laughs> right? Now, I'm not necessarily advocating that, but, you know, that guy's not going to get very far if everybody on the plane has a gun, right? But yet we take all the guns from everybody, and we actually make ourselves feel more secure for the, for the experience. So it's an example of the misalignment between real versus perceived security. And so, like with any technology, you have to first know what you're aiming at. And we have lots of things 
that we can do to make edge devices and network tunnels and data stores and, and machine learning models and secure and do. Um, but it, we can't address the problem from a security perspective if what we're aiming at is, is ghosts. Great question. In addition to the smart designer, can you give an example or two of projects that Clear Object is working on? Sure can. I'll use some public references. Um, there's a company called AES. Uh, they are a power conglomerate. They own a lot of power companies, own in, uh, Indianapolis Power and Light, for instance. They run wind farms, uh, big turbines. You may have seen these uh, you know, if you've traveled up by 65 here in Indiana recently. Um, uh, they may very well own those. I don't really know. But what they've been doing is they've been paying a company to send uh, drones to take pictures of the blades looking for damage. But when you do that, all you get is a bunch of pictures. And some poor schlub has to go through all those pictures one by one. And after about the 10,000th picture, you can imagine how accurate that probably is. So what they did was they paid us to build a solution where they take the pictures and they use them to train a machine learning model in the cloud. And then we build a dashboard for them to display just the pictures that the machine learning model thinks might have a problem. So now what we can do is take hundreds, thousands of pictures and run them through the machine learning model and very quickly hone in on the ones so that when the AES engineers log in the morning, they only see a limited subset of pictures so that they can take, decide what action they're going to take. Um, in this case, the data stream was photographs, right, coming from a drone. But you can apply that same basic concept to almost any data stream. And if you let your mind go a little bit, you can think of all the other people that have towers, cell phone towers, wind farm operators, utility poles. That same exact solution is useful for almost all of them, right? And it's these same elements that I'm talking to you about, an edge device sending data, a machine learning model in the cloud trained with historical data that's used to apply great value to raw, live raw data, small amounts of it, for the benefit of the humans that then are able to understand what it means, interpret it, and, and take action on it. Question was, can you re-describe an edge device? Yeah, this is a bit of a term we use in the industry. It really refers to anything that isn't the cloud, right? It's out there on the edge. So in my example I just gave you, the edge device would be the wind turbine or, or, or the drone. Uh, in the example of the igniter, it would be the igniter itself, right? It's whatever is the source, the ultimate endpoint of where the data is coming from. And one of the interesting things in our industry that's happening right now is that used to be a one-way trip. We used to collect data from the edge and then send it to the cloud in order to interpret it. But now with so much data coming from the edge, we now need to be selective about what data. In fact, we're experimenting with things where the machine learning model itself calls for more or less of certain data in order to verify results for so if it thinks that the model is off or that it needs to adjust the model, then it can actually ask the edge devices for more of a certain type of data and less than another so that it can you know, hone in on an answer more rapidly. So a live conversation between the edge and the cloud is kind of the white hot center of what's going on in the IoT business. How's the industry addressing interoperability and standards with regards to keeping IoT open so that it can be accepted and used by the masses? Well, that's a great question. I don't think we're doing a really good job on this one, quite frankly. There are a few de facto standards that have emerged, which is also true often in lots of technological advancement areas. Uh, there's a technology or a protocol called MQTT, which is widely used for message sending and passing between edge devices and, and the cloud, for instance. But that technology just became the de facto. It wasn't like some group of leaders got together and said, this is how the standard of this industry is going to be done. It's a little early, uh, you know, historically for that to occur. I mean, it, it happened in the cloud. It eventually, in the beginning, it was Wild West. It happened and happens in almost every technological in, uh, you know, innovation area. It has not yet happened in IoT. We haven't had a standards body emerge for it. There has not been conventions developed yet that you have to hold to. So we're we're still not quite there, Ron. John just really wanted to thank you for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. It was a very interesting presentation. We also would like You're to welcome. thank all of our attendees today. The alumni board is working through future uh, presentations.
And please be sure to check our website for any updates on the alumni series. Also wanted to let everyone know that if you are a fan of Boilermaker football and will be in town for the TCU game on September 14th, be sure to register for the Purdue Technology Alumni Tailgate hosted by the Alumni Board. Details can be found at giving.u.edu slash tech tailgate 19. And it is also on the Polytechnic website. So thank you all and have a great Techie Tuesday.